my son with uh, Gilad and Eyal uh, were missing and then were found. Um, they were kidnapped and murdered. There was a, a tremendous uh, uh, funeral, like 100,000 people. And one of, the, one of the people who spoke was the, the Rosh Hashiva of their high school, of, of two of them. And he said, you know, people say where there are two Jews, there are already three opinions. We see now that where there are two Jews, there are three opinions, but one heart. Over time, first of all, I, I learned to appreciate not only the one heart, which is totally unbelievable and unreal, but also the three opinions, the hundredth opinions. It's who we are. We're, we're, uh, we're very opinionated and we're very passionate about our opinions. I'm in the process of learning that people are very, very different from each other and the things that, that work for me don't necessarily work for anybody else. Um, so I can, I can um, uh, say things about my experience and if, if it resonates with anybody, um, that's great. But, but, but it's very important to, to understand that we're so different and we all, you know, we, we have our own toolbox and we choose to use different tools and, and sometimes we choose not to. And sometimes uh, it takes us a very long time before we even pick up our head and, and look around and say, okay, is there still a life for me? So it's not my experience, but, but people are different and that's, that's the reality. Um, to me, it was... It was about um, leaving room in, in my life and our life for a, a spectrum of, of experiences. It's about uh, making room for, for uh, you know, for, for sorrow or for weeping um, and, and for laughter and for joy and for everything in between. And a person could definitely choose to, you know, pick up this bucket of black paint and, and spill it all over their life. Uh, it, it's a choice, and, and I don't think uh, one could be critical of that, that it's not the choice I wanted to make. And uh, what works for me often is to tell myself, um, I can feel pain, I don't have to become my pain. I can feel sorrow, I don't have to become my sorrow. And in my inner landscape, there's so much, you know, so many colors, so many dreams, so many disappointments, so many hurts, sometimes so much blessing in my life. So my core experience is, is a feeling very, very blessed. And yes, life is complicated. It's, it's uh, you know, some days you wake up and, and just feeling joyful is no longer the default. But, but still, there, there are so many colors and, and you can choose to be there. I, I think, I don't know how it is abroad, but in Israel, when there are stories like this, people come to a shiva call and they, they put your, their hand on your shoulder and they look you in your, hand, in, in your eyes and, and they say in Hebrew, Tiyu chazakim, be strong. And to me, it's not about being strong. It's about being flexible and making room in your life for different things different kinds of things and, and, and a variety of experiences. And, and, that, and that has a lot of strength to it. <laughs> People talk about the effect of time and, and time has different effects. It doesn't necessarily make everything easier. It sometimes makes things worse because, uh, you know, the longer the past, the more you miss, the more you feel what you missed out, etc. But there is the very, at least by me, <laughs> it was the very beginning, the first few months that I felt I was working on breathing and, um, and putting oxygen in and staying there and, and waiting for a wave to pa of pain to pass. And, and you know, it's, it's a little bit like being in the delivery room, <laughs> you know, the pain accumulates, you have to breathe. Okay, and it, and it passes. So, so it was a very basic beginning level, but but from there on, uh, a challenge was to separate uh, memories from the pain. Because there was no reason that uh, every time I think of my wonderful son, it would be a stab in the stomach. It's, uh, yes, there is pain to this story, but the years we had together were amazing and the memories are wonderful. And uh, it, it took some time to, to separate the two. 
there's pain for the loss, but the memory is great. Um, so I, I found that uh, challenging but rewarding. And I feel he lives on with us in many different ways. I know the concept of, uh, of people, people having a crisis of faith after you know, something bad happens. Um, sometimes people feel deserted or uh, very you know, disappointed, forsaken. Sometimes the whole concept of you know, how the world works gets, gets shaken up. To me, and this is not judgmental, it's just a description of my world, to me it, feel, it felt um, irrational. Because before there were bad things happening to other people, and I was a believer, and now something bad touched our life. So what changed? When we, when we pray, we say, um, shalom okay, that uh, God creates peace and creates everything. And uh, that's only politically correct, the way Rav Steinberg once told me, politically correct for the original verse in, in Isaiah that actually says, shalom that God makes peace and creates evil. So my belief is that everything in this world is a godly creation, even the evil parts of it. And I often don't understand why. And sometimes, you know, it's just too much. And, and you, you mostly feel you don't understand. But it, it, to me, it didn't, you know, it didn't create a crisis of faith. It, uh, it, it, it was part of what we always saw, but just in a very, very personal way. That specific experience was mostly feeling very vulnerable, uh, you know, taking off some of our uh, um, paddings and, you know, everything, that, all our pr protection levels, you know, um, layers, and, uh, and, and feeling exposed and feeling... Um, out of control, and the things I want more than anything else are, are totally out of my control. So to me, it was mostly a lesson in humility and proportions, you know, where I am, who runs the show. So being so fragile and so vulnerable kind of brought me closer. But the world is a complicated place and, and you know, uh, People feel sometimes that it's, uh, <laughs> we're expected to have only uh, nice things happen and you know, everything's going to be all rosy. Um, it ain't so. It doesn't work like that. And actually, our life compared to the lives of people that lived you know, the centuries before us are a thousand times better. And it created by us these expectations that we won't have to suffer at all. With enough technology, enough medicine, we'll all live you know, happily ever after. Apparently that's not the deal. And, and living here is, comes with a bunch of things that aren't always pleasant. I, I never saw anybody um, uh, you know, trying to calculate that they got too much blessing in their life. We, we always start complaining when, when it works the other way. So on the whole, I think, I think on a personal level, I feel very, very blessed. And I also have my pain, <laughs> but, but nobody said that uh, anything else was to be expected around here. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about resilience. Because um, my husband and I are really ordinary people, but we were faced with an extraordinary challenge. And the question was really, how were we going to not only survive after Kobe's murder, he was, in 2001, he was 13. He was our oldest child, and we had three other little kids. And how were we going to be parents to our children? So, in fact, after he was killed, after we found out that he was murdered, I fell to the ground and I looked at my husband and I said, 
what are we going to what are we going to do how 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 are we ever going to live with this and he looked at me seth and he said we have three other children and because the terrorists killed kobe we're not going to let them destroy us so what i'm talking about here it's our story but it's also the jewish story and it's it's also your story so Kobe's death really transformed us. And my definition of resilience is being transformed, being expanded. Um, the root of resilience in English, it's resalir. It's really to go back to who you were, to leap back. Like people think that if you have a tragedy and you go back to being exactly who you were, that that's successful. But my definition and the Jewish definition of resilience, I believe, is to become greater. Because we never want to go back to being who we were. If you go back to who you're be being who you were, I, it's a kind of failure. Because in every suffering, there's, there's some revelation. And most people think of grief that you want some kind of closure. But actually, in Judaism, we don't look at life as having closure. And we're not looking for our struggles. We don't try to close them. We're not looking for closure. We're looking for disclosure. Mm -hmm. Disclosure. We're looking for revelation. And we're always trying to find God's light. And sometimes God really shines his light on us. Um, very interesting things happen when you open your life and open your world to becoming, to expanding in a way that you would never have thought of. Uh, in my book, this book, it's um, The Road to Resilience, I talk about the seven steps of resilience, and they all start with the C. The first C is chaos, and most people would rather avoid that step. The first step in any, facing any conflict, any struggle, is chaos, because you lose control. And we all want it, another C word that it's not in my book, but we all want to be in control. And chaos means we, we lose control. And just to give you a very um, small example of this, I'm sure some of you remember when you would go for a, a drive and you had to use a map right? And you had no phone. So I was with my children. They were four kids under, well, I think it was three kids under the age of five. And we were going to see, meet my husband. And it was like a six hour trip. I hate driving. I mean, I drive, but I don't really like it. And I get nervous. And the kids, well, they were fine, but the dog was in the car and he, he really did throw up on my foot at that while we were driving. Everything was in chaos. And then I thought it was in chaos. Then I had the directions and the phone number on a piece of paper on my lap. Oh, and I think after the dog threw up, I opened the window. The whole paper went flying out the window on the throughway. So I didn't know where we were going. I didn't have the phone number. And I, I mean, I thought that was chaos. But actually, often life sends us these events where there's no map for it. There's just no map. How do you deal with this? And sometimes you, what I found is that people are really afraid of feeling. And they think, they say, be strong, be strong. And I, I really think that's a problem. Because why should you be strong when something, something terrible has happened? I think that you need to be weak then. And you need to feel, well, I don't think it's being weak. It's feeling, allowing yourself to feel. Because if you don't go through the process, if you don't let that chaos in, or, and I think the chaos is an, it's another word for suffering sometimes, if you don't let the suffering in, it will come chase you the rest of your life. It will come after you. And in fact, um, I've read studies where it says that psychiatric admissions, 25% of psychiatric admissions are related to grief, to unprocessed grief or complicated grief. So a person has to be able to feel, but, but 
often it's too much for an individual or a family to deal with. And that's what happened to us. It was way too much. Our little family, how could we absorb such crisis, such conflict? We were basically new immigrants in Israel. We were, um, we'd been in Israel for five years, and we have no family here. And my Hebrew at that point was pretty pathetic, non-existent. My husband's was a little better. But the community came in to help us. And that's the second C, is community. And well, the second C is really a K, it's kindness. But I couldn't put kindness because it doesn't start with C. So it's community. But that's what you have here. I mean, that's what Chabad is also. Part of Chabad is the community. And that's what Jews have, right? We put the community in the center. In fact, in Judaism, it's not like in America where it's the rugged individual and you're not supposed to talk about your troubles and you keep everything hidden. And it's like the hero is the cowboy who rides off into the... Where does he ride? I don't know where he rides. In the wilderness, something like that, to deal with his problems by himself. No, Judaism, we're a community, and the community is supposed to take care of the person who's suffering. And that's what happened to us, that the community came in and took care of us. And they didn't say, what do you need? Because the person who is suffering doesn't know what they need. They, they, don't know, they have no idea. I didn't know what I needed. So they brought food. They did my, our laundry. They took our kids to school. They decided what we needed. And if I didn't like it, I said no. But of course I liked it because they cooked for us <laughs> and, and did the laundry. So that was nice. And they also brought us Shabbos meals for six months, which was also very nice. It got, to, except to, it got, it was very good for me because it got to the point where my husband said after six months, um, you know, I think your cooking is better. So <laughs> it took six months, but okay. <laughs> At least he, he, he reached that. But that's the strength of the Jewish people, that we're able to find our koach, our strength. When we don't have it, we can get it from the community. So I'm just going to end with a story about um, Kobe. That during the shiva, a boy, Kobe's class came to us, eighth grade boys. And I, hate, I have to admit, I hated seeing them. Because I had just had my son, and then my son is dead. And there, I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. And they came in as a group, and there was one really little boy. And they pushed this boy. They, like, kicked him and shoved him there. Like, one big boy is like, tell him, tell him. And they, I'm telling you, he's, like, kicking him, this big boy. And this little shy boy came up to us, and he said that he was in, um, they'd been in sport in gym class that week. And he said, and I'm not a very good athlete. And I thought, you don't have to tell me, I can see that. But he was so little and so shy and glasses and hunched over. And he said, and Kobe, the teacher made Kobe the captain of the team. Now, you have to understand that when we moved to Israel, Kobe didn't speak Hebrew. And the first summer, I remember I saw him at the library by himself, and I thought, Oh, he, he was so popular in Silver Spring and so happy, and, and I felt really guilty about bringing him to Israel. And then I thought, you know what? First of all, he loved Israel. And then I said, he'll learn empathy, because you, you take the kid who's the leader of the class and really make him a nerd. So at the shiva, this boy said to me, Kobe was the, um, he had first pick in volleyball. And he picked me. So my daughter looked at Seth and I, and he, she said, he picked, she whispered, he, she picked, he picked him? Because Kobe was, he loved to win. Like, we lived in Silver Spring, but he rooted for the Dallas Cowboys. He was with the winners. There's, of course, there's great sadness, and that sadness will never go away. But resilience... Resilience has the word, once, after my book was published, I looked at it, and it, it looked like it said resilience. I, it looked like there was a typo, and I thought it said re-silent. Re like they, they'd spelled it wrong, re-silent. And yes, I mean, we read la last week's Parsha about Nadav and Avihu, or is it this week's, Nadav and Avihu, that um, 
we're, we're made silent sometimes when we can't, when there's really, because there's no language to describe what's happened. But re- resilient also has the word salience in it. And salience is having a sense of what's important and what's significant. So my blessing to you and to all of us is that when people ask me what they should do in terms of Kobe, well, you know, be involved with the Kobe Mandel Foundation and invite us to speak, but also to become more Jewish because Kobe really put Judaism in the center of his world in Israel. As we all know, life is all about choices. And when I was 13 years old, I was faced with a number of choices about whether or not I could move forward from having just lost my mother and two sisters in a plane crash. So my mother was 39, my sisters were 11 and eight, and I was left with a dad who was completely traumatized, obviously. And at 13, I had to make some very important choices about how I was going to deal with this terrible tragedy. Back in the 70s, there was no professional help available. Nobody really understood or knew how to deal with tragic situations. And coming from a good place, people thought the best way to move forward was to be distracted and to do anything you can to take the pain away from the people who were suffering. So one of the things I did that I really do believe was an amazing choice was I used all of my experience for the first 13 years of my life, having grown up in a home where we did a lot for others and we made a difference in the lives of other people. I went out as a 13 year old and began volunteering at hospitals and nursing homes so that I could help other people and take my mind off the tragedy that I was having to deal with alone. And I truly believe that when we do reach out and we help other people, not only is it an important distraction so that you can have some emotional anesthetic from the pain that you're dealing with on your own, but it really does make a difference when you know that you are able to use whatever strength you have left in you to actually help other people and to help people move forward, especially people who are suffering as well. We now know all these years later, that it's really important to do the grief work when you've gone through any kind of loss. And it doesn't have to be something as horrific as losing three family members in a plane crash. Loss is loss. And anytime someone is suffering from a loss, whether it's the loss of a loved one or loss of something in their life, loss of a dream, loss of a marriage, loss of their health, something or someone is missing and gone and people are in pain. And I would say that the most important thing to do is to do the grief work, to actually feel that pain and experience that grief, but at the same time, reach for other ways of replacing some of that sadness. And some of those ways of doing that is to reach out and help others. And I truly believe that that's part of our core Jewish values, right? I mean, we're taught to repair the world. We're taught to make a difference in the lives of others, be honest, have integrity, do whatever we can to help other people. And, um, you know, aside from all of that kindness, it's also important to count our blessings. And when you're going through a terrible loss, you have to sometimes really dig deep to find reasons to be grateful and reasons to thank God for what you do have. And I think if we combine all of those together, it's a good recipe for moving forward and making good choices about how to live life in a meaningful way. And really life is all about choices. Having grown up in a home where core Jewish values were evident everywhere, we were a family that always reached out and did things for other people. And my parents just instilled these amazing Jewish values into us. So I took those as tools and ways of moving forward and and important lessons in life that I believe are the reasons I was able to make some of the choices I made. And, you know, you have to hold on to your faith. You have to know that God is going to take care of you no matter what. And that I feel I was spared death at such a young age for a reason. And I was meant to go out and do something to help other people, to make a difference, to do my small share in repairing the pain of other people. And I really do believe that that is 
what helped me. That was the foundation I had in order to move forward. And I tell young parents all the time, don't ever underestimate what you're teaching your young children and make sure you instill those really good Jewish values into them because it will serve them well moving forward. I think looking back um, at my life and at the choices I made compared to the choices my father made, here we were going through the same tragedy. We had each lost three family members, but we made very different choices about how to move forward. And as a teenager, I couldn't understand why my father was so broken that he was unable to parent me. He was unable to live again. He simply, in my mind, existed. And now, all these years later, I really do understand that he was doing the best that he could under the circumstances with no intervention, no professional help, really just kind-hearted people who wanted him to try to move forward rather than experience the pain and, and talk about it and get the support he needed. So, you know, I think learning um, how to accept other people and taking people's situations into consideration and not judging them is also really critical because we never know what people are dealing with. Lots of people don't share what is hurting them or what kind of pain they're in. And, you know, we look at some people and we just assume they've had a very privileged, blessed, easy life, but really we never know what's going on behind closed doors. And as a therapist, I have an inside view and it's often quite different than what we see on the outside or what we see on Facebook or any kind of social media posts. And people don't always wear their heart on their soul and we have to be compassionate and caring.